Um, good morning and happy Europe Day. My name's Vicki Birchfield. I am an associate professor of the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs here at Georgia Tech. And I have the privilege of directing um, our European Union Center of Excellence. We're one of 10 centers uh, competitively selected and funded by the European Commission. Um, we have had the opportunity to administer a European Union Center of Excellence here at Georgia Tech since 2008. And each year, it's always a, an honor to take time to commemorate this important day, Europe Day. 61 years ago, May 9, 1950, French Foreign Minister Robert Schumann launched um, the project that would uh, lead us to the European Union that we know today, 27 countries strong, half a billion citizens, 23 official languages, and one day every year coming together to commemorate the progress, to recognize um, the unparalleled experiment of building democracy and policy beyond national borders. Um, today is a, a very interesting moment to reflect upon the progress and the evolution of the European Union over these past six decades. And it's my distinct honor to be able to assemble today our local diplomatic corps. Um, and I've asked them, we have a very general theme, you've noticed, European leadership in an uncertain world. There are many things to reflect on, good morning, um, in, in terms of where Europe is today and the challenges that it faces as the repercussions of the global financial crisis continue to hit, um, the sovereign debt crisis across Europe, um, the many rescue packages and bailouts, um, the uprisings in the Middle East, um, NATO mission in Libya led by European states, many things that are challenging Europe and its effort to continue to sustain solidarity in these challenging times. I've asked each of the consuls to speak um, to this broad theme, asking them to reflect on their country as a member state in the European Union and to speak to any of these themes or anything else that they might wish to share with you in an effort to recognize um, the importance of Europeans um, not only in the world as global leaders in many of these policy areas, but also to recognize and appreciate their presence right here in Atlanta and throughout the Southeast. These are very busy, impressive individuals, and it's a great honor to have them with us this morning to commemorate this special day. I'm going to introduce them uh, briefly now, and, uh, and then they will each have 10 minutes to speak and that should leave us almost uh, half an hour to have a discussion with you in the audience. So we're gonna begin this morning with Hungary. Hungary, as you may know, holds the rotating presidency of the European Union at this moment and will do so until uh, July when they pass the baton to uh, Poland. Mr. John Parkerson is the honorary consul uh, for Hungary and he's going to start us off and then I will briefly introduce the subsequent speakers. Thank you very much, and John, the floor is yours. Well, thank you for being here today. Are we on? I don't hear it. It is on? Okay, thank you. That's gonna, that's gonna sound and look very good on this tape recording. Um, but I, I'm happy that Vicki has introduced me and, and uh, given Hungary the opportunity to be first on the panel because, as she mentioned, Hungary does occupy the, the presidency um, of the EU at this moment, and I'll get into that in, in just a little bit. Um, but as you know, the theme is European leadership in an uncertain world, and I, as I thought about it, I wondered uh, where does the European Union, and then more specifically, where does Hungary have an opportunity to provide the leadership in this uncertain world. I think we start from a couple of general concepts. One that we have to keep in mind is this idea of the European Union as 27 states that in many areas of shared common interests have pooled their sovereignty. They haven't given up their sovereignty to, to the European Union but they've agreed to collaborate, to cooperate in areas of shared interest in, in a pooled manner. At the same time, keep in mind that each of the member states of the European Union have their national self-interest. So we see these two 
uh, chief themes, I think, being balanced uh, at this, especially at this particular moment in time in the European Union where leadership is so important. I wanted to just uh, focus on a couple of, of areas where I, where I see some particular common interests among all the, the European Union states. One, of course, is the global financial and economic situation. That probably comes as no surprise to you. Shared interests throughout. It's a key agenda basket, if we want to call it that, of the Hungarian presidency, and there, there are good reasons for that. And then a second area that I'm just going to touch on is the area of environment and energy. It's, uh, it should come as no surprise also that this afternoon's program focuses on energy. And of course, uh, the, the EU Center of Excellence and some other uh, sponsors, including the Consulate General of, uh, of Germany and the uh, German Embassy, are sponsoring that, that particular program. Well, I think that the reason, uh, the, the fact that that issue is on this afternoon's program itself speaks a lot of, about the importance of a common energy um, approach within the European Union. I'll start by giving a couple of examples in each of those two areas. Uh, these are, I like, to, I like to pull news items from the, the week, this week, uh, uh, to use as my examples to support each of these two areas of uh, global financial and economic situation and environmental energy. Uh, I think my, my colleague, uh, the Consul General of Germany, Luz Gergens, uh, maybe a little bit amused that I use this as, a, as an example. He doesn't know what I'm going to say. But <laughs> um, one of the uh, domestic, purely internal matters that has caused some, some uh, controversy in Hungary within the past few weeks has been the, uh, the adoption of a new constitution within Hungary. It just so happens that the current party in power in Hungary, the Fidesz party led by Prime Minister or Orban, has an absolute majority uh, in the Hungarian parliament. So that, that gives that party significant, significant powers. Well, the new constitution that just was enacted, um, of course, uh, Fidesz took advantage of the fact that they had this absolute majority and there was some criticism um, within the European Union with, its, uh, with Hungary's neighboring states uh, that maybe this was somehow counter-democratic. Well, I think it's interesting that the, the greater interests of the European Union um, rise to the surface when you have this type of internal controversy within the European Union and eventually uh, those, uh, those points of friction, such as Hungary's new constitution, um, are, are resolved and relegated because relatively uh, they are less important than some of the other, the greater issues. And in this case, the global financial and economic situation. Chancellor Merkel of, of Germany um, uh, approached Prime Minister Orban and, and expressed some concern about the new Hungarian constitution. This was perceived initially in the European press as some sort of breakdown of the cooperation, the collaborative efforts of the members of the European Union to act together. But I think uh, two days ago, uh, Chancellor Merkel is issued a statement um, after some consultations with Prime Minister Orban, and she said, let's put this aside. Um, we're convinced that Hungary um, continues to follow the democratic path consistent with European Union ideals, and that trade and investment, the, the global financial and economic situation are more important uh, than these kinds of frictions. And there was a resolution between the two. Chancellor Merkel also stated that trade and investment were most important. The internal market within Europe was first and foremost, and she cited the close collaboration and huge investment that German companies have made into, in the European economy. I think that shows, uh, is a good illustration of how member states of the European Union, when they consult and when they take the larger picture into consideration, can resolve these kinds of issues. 
The second one, the example I give, if you went to the website of the European Union today, this day, www.eu2011.hu, the lead story there concerns something called the Eastern Partnership. Uh, and it talks about um, very successful negotiations that just concluded uh, between um, the European Union led by Hungary and its role as president um, to cement relationships with Moldova. Moldova is part of, is one of the eastern neighbors of uh, the countries of Central and Eastern Europe. And while European Union doesn't have it on its agenda yet, and may never, to incorporate Moldova as a European Union member, it, it provides certain neighbors uh, a status of association with the European Union. Now, how does that relate to energy? If you've studied international relations and understand the international financial crisis and the role that, that energy plays and the dependence of, on the countries of Europe on uh, energy sources for primarily oil and gas that come from countries that are non-member states of the European Union, then you'll understand, I think, the strategic value of adding um, certain special relationships with Eastern partners. And this is called the Eastern Partnership Strategy. I, I won't go into that in any detail, but I'd be happy to answer any questions about that later. I'm just going to conclude with a few remarks about how Hungary has an opportunity to exert leadership on each of these issues um, at, within the European Union. First, as, we, as Vicky mentioned, um, Europe currently holds the presidency of the Council of the European Union. That doesn't mean that some individual from Hungary holds the presidency. We think of President Obama, an individual, as holding the presidency, but under the institutional structure of the European Union, countries hold the presidency. This is the one institution that allows equal representation of all the countries because it rotates every six months. Now the countries of the European Union understand, of course, that six months is a very short time in order to create an agenda and to see the items in that agenda implemented by all member states. So they've, they've sort of adopted in an informal manner something called the, the TRIO approach so that a trio of states that consecutively hold the presidency of the European Union can agree on a common, very broad agenda, so that at least within 18 months, maybe there's more of a likelihood that those agenda issues somehow can be uh, resolved. It's understood, of course, that following the trio, that there, there still will be work that has not been finished that would pass to the next probably trio of European Union states. Let me just illustrate. Um, the current trio, Hungary is the third in the trio. Hungary was, was um, preceded by Belgium, which held the presidency for six months, and for Spain, by Spain, the prior six months to, to Belgium. So you have Spain, Belgium, and Hungary. A year and a half ago, those three states, foreign ministers and other officials got together and they actually met physically and said, how do we set the agenda? I think that's kind of interesting that you have this collaborative approach. But at the same time, while they create an agenda where those three countries plus the, the other 24, making 27 if my math is correct, have, an, have a truly shared interest in the agenda, reflected in the agenda, the presidency does provide some power for a particular state that holds the presidency to shape the agenda when it comes time for that country to hold the presidency. Um, for instance, Hungary, through the presidency, controls the debate within the council. Um, each of the substantive areas within the council that are being addressed, whether it's finance, energy, social issues, is headed by a minister from the country of Hungary. You know from chairing meetings yourself, that if you're the chairperson, that you have some ability to, sh to focus discussion on particular interests, particular agenda items that, are, that uh, support your self-interest. 
And Hungary is able to do that to some extent too. And we see it in issues such as, just for example, enlargement of the Schengen zone. Hungary's eastern neighbors, Bulgaria, Romania, or Romania are not members of the, the Schengen zone yet. Hungary's pushing that as just one of the agenda items. They're, they're neighbors. Uh, and uh, they feel that there should be a greater flow of persons between the countries uh, that are not members of the Schengen Zone, but members of the European Union and Hungary. Uh, environmental protection and water management. You know, there's an initiative called the Danube Basin Initiative within the Hungarian agenda, and that's to ensure that the Danube remains unpolluted, remains a source of of, of water supply uh, to the countries that um, are along the Danube, and there are many of them within Central and Eastern Europe. Um, at the same time, through its Eastern Partnership Program, um, Hungary with M Moldova, again as the, as the illustration, wants to ensure that it can, that it has um, secure, reliable, ability to access oil and gas from countries to the east and reduce its energy dependence on Russia, where 90 percent of Hungary's oil and gas come from. I'll just sum up on the energy and then pass it to the next colleague issue. Also this past week, uh, there was, a, there was an, uh, a headline story in the leading newspaper in Reykjavik, Iceland, Iceland is not yet a member of the European Union, but the story concerned geothermal development in Hungary. An Icelandic company called, named Manvit uh, maintains the Budapest um, office and it's assisting the Hungarian government in exploiting the huge geothermal resources that, that are in Hungary. Iceland has been exploiting those resources for many years. And Iceland in this manner sees itself already as part of the European Union, even though not a member. Well, one of, one of the, uh, the items, agenda items of the Hungarian government is to push the accession of Iceland as a member state into the European Union. It's, it's, it's no surprise that there's this level of, of business collaboration leads to political collaboration as well. And with that, I'll conclude. I just wanted to uh, point out a few issues, and I hope Vicki will guide the discussion to the next panelist. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. I, I especially appreciate your plug for our afternoon program. I hope you'll all stay for that. And you've set up the stage very nicely for our next speaker, um, who uh, is Dr. Lutz Gergens, who's the Consul General of Germany. And Germany, we know, is quite a leader in sustainable energy and renewable energy, which will be the focus of our program this afternoon. Um, Dr. Gergens is also the Dean of the Consular Corps here in Atlanta, and uh, you have the floor now for 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky. I salute a small but very distinguished audience, and I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I apologize that I couldn't mingle with you before the discussion started. That had been my intention, but I felt myself very much in an uncertain world and uh, also felt that I provided myself very bad leadership in finding my way here. <laughs> I would like to make four points, uh, two political and uh, two economic ones. Uh, the the uh, political one is that here in the US, uh, the European Union sometimes is perceived as uh, providing too little leadership in uh, military conflict. In Europe, the US is sometimes perceived as providing too little leadership in soft power, in uh, strengthening uh, civil, sustainable uh, civil movements in worlds, in, in, in countries where our future lies, emerging markets, etc., unstable countries. And I think we should mutually recognize each other's important role in leadership. The U.S. role has emerged to be more military. 
the European Union role has emerged to be more economic. If you look at the share of GDP which European countries invest in development aid, for instance, it by far succeeds per capita. It by far succeeds what, what the US does. So rather than finger pointing at mutual lacks, we should recognize uh, each other's strengths in this area. And uh, I, I uh, submit that uh, European leadership around the world to maintain peace and uh, bring about wealth and prosperity is just as well as the leadership of the United States of America. The, uh, the second political point is uh, pertaining specifically to Germany. Mm, you, you might want, I, I would like to preempt your questions concerning our uh, voting behavior in the uh, Libyan issue. The, uh, where, as you may know, Germany did not vote uh, in favor of the re uh, resolution uh, authorizing the uh, non-fly zone over Libya together with our allies, the United States, Britain and France, but rather to abstain together with the BRIC countries, uh, Brazil, Russia, India and China. An interesting coalition that was for us, but it is quite in keeping with the culture of military, military restraint which is deeply enrooted, since 1945 that is, in German hi history and uh, in, in German foreign policy in particular. Our foreign policy is first and foremost peace policy and the basic law, the preamble to the basic law which is our constitution states that the Federal Republic of Germany aims at serving the peace of the world in a united Europe. Now my two economic points. Uh, Vicky talked about the uh, Europe's sovereign debt crisis and uh, as in some previous uh, discussions here in Atlanta I challenged that, uh, that headline. What? European sovereign debt crisis. There are three countries which uh, have been for uh, quite a while in difficulties and uh, their, their share of EU GDP is roughly 6%. It is less, far less, than the combined share of New York and California in US GDP and yet the deficit and uh, the, uh, the financial situation, the fiscal situation of these two US states is much more negative than that of Greece, Ireland and Portugal combined. And nobody talks about a US sovereign debt crisis. And if you did, I would say that is exaggerated. Well, there is indeed a difference. The, it, it is for the financial market less certain that the other 94% of, of the European U Union would, will stand by the countries I named in the case a very hypothetical, hypothetical case of a prolonged difficulty, it is less certain than in the case of the United States of America, where you have a far closer union. And uh, it is also less certain that these countries will, because their, their obligations are less, there is a, a, a bigger amount of, of uh, sovereignty to European Union member states than to the state of Georgia or the state of California and uh, the state of New York. And you quarrel about uh, the, the, the state rights here in the United States. 
Well, I tell you, the state rights in the European Union are even stronger, definitely. We are 27 proud sovereign nations. The second economic element is uh, an important point which my Hungarian colleague already alluded to, the importance of the global economic and financial framework. We believe that in the framework of G8 and G20, the US and the European Union have to provide joint leadership. Together, we are by far the, the, uh, the biggest economic group in terms of flows of trade, in terms of investment, in terms of output, the EU and the United States by far eclipse all other markets, even if the growth rates of the other markets presently are stronger than those of EU uh, countries and uh, the US, but the other countries, including China, have a long, long way to go until they reach the economic strength of the EU plus the US. This is why this joint economic and financial leadership is so important. And I think uh, progress is quite considerable if you look at, uh, at the difficulties uh, which have emerged uh, since uh, 2008. I believe, uh, I happen to be on the same page with uh, Gordon Brown on that issue, I believe that the joint leadership uh, in the, in the financial crises in 2008 have been quite extraordinary in order to prevent a catastrophe like uh, the one the world witnessed uh, in the late 20s and early 30s. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I just, I can't uh, interject too many comments or we'll run behind, but I appreciate um, your comments uh, about the sovereign debt crisis and the comparison with the U.S. economy. This was an, a point, I didn't intentionally say that to provoke you, but I'm glad I did because uh, Dr. Gergens made this point at another panel uh, hosted by the Atlanta Council on International Relations, and I know my colleague Basilio is glad that he did, and he may pick up that theme again at the end. Um, I just want to add two quick points um, just to, to emphasize um, the, the comments that Dr. Gergens made about the importance of the transatlantic economy, the economic relationship, um, you might be interested to know that it is the, to the tune of about $2 billion in trade every single day just across the Atlantic. So this is not to be underestimated as we worry about the rise of the rest. Uh, the transatlantic economy is an essential part of, of the global economy and, and I think many people don't appreciate its value. Um, and also, just one other comment about soft power, um, your first political point. Some of you might be uh, surprised to learn that um, the Europeans actually contribute 40% to the UN budget for peacekeeping operations, compared to 26% uh, provided by the United States. Um, so that uh, fact just sprung to mind, and I wanted to share that with you. Now we'll proceed, and we have uh, Mr. Pascal Le Dinf, uh, the Consul General of France, next on program. Good morning, everyone, and happy uh, Europe Day. I would like first to thank you very much for coming this morning and uh, express my gratitude to the uh, European Union uh, uh, Center of Excellence, and especially uh, Vicky Bierschville, for organizing uh, such an interesting panel. EU leadership in an uh, uncertain world. Uh, Lutz made four points. I will make three points. The first one, the first one uh, is economically. Uh, I think that uh, the EU has, uh, over the past uh, years, contributed significantly to uh, the European uh, economic prosperity uh, and also uh, has been a contributor to the to the economic, to the world economic recovery over the past two years. My second point would be a political one. Um, I would argue that Europe is becoming uh, a stronger global uh, player on international scene. And with the implementation of the Lisbon Treaty is in a better position to defend its own interest and to contribute to peace and stability in the world. 
And my third point is very close to what uh, Lutz highlighted, is that Europe and, uh, and, US and the US remain each other's main partner, and that uh, both economically and politically, uh, we need not less but more cooperation between our two uh, uh, assembles. First, economically, um, uh, we have uh, experienced uh, uh, over the past 20 years in, in Europe, as you know, a tremendous transformation. And I think the European Union has acted as an exporter of stability and economic prosperity, especially to the, towards the eastern part uh, of Europe. Uh, nobody would, would uh, uh, contest that. Um, uh, and uh, over the past two years, I think uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, thanks to the stimulus packages that uh, we coordinated uh, within the European Union and also uh, with the US and other major players in the world, we have uh, uh, overcome uh, this uh, financial uh, and international crisis. And we, we did our part uh, by better coordinating our economic policies and by contributing to the international cooperation uh, towards this economic world eco recovery that we see today. Of course, there are still many factors of instability and uncertainty. The emergence of new international currencies, uh, increased volatility of exchange rates, war of exchange rates, sometimes is, it is commented, acceleration of international uh, capital flows and macroeconomic uh, imbalances, uh, also volatility of uh, prices of commodities. But in this context, the euro, of course, has been under a lot of stress uh, over the past uh, two, uh, two years, especially in the last year. Uh, and we are now emerging from this, this crisis, I believe. Recovery is on the way. Growth is back. Uh, in my country, it will be between 2 and 2.5% two and in 2011. We are creating jobs. Uh, we are reducing uh, unemployment. It's 9% now in France. Uh, we are also re reducing our deficit, our public deficits. It was uh, in France 7% of GDP in 2010. It will be 5.7% in 2011. And our goal is to obtain a 3% deficit in 2013. Um, European leaders have repeatedly underlined their strong determination to do whatever it takes to defend the euro. And they demonstrated, um, as I will um, detail in, in a few minutes, their solidarity with governments uh, that are in difficulties. Why? Because, first of all, behind the eurozone, behind the, the euro project, is a political project. It's the construction of Europe which is at stake. And uh, I think that both Germany and France has demonstrated that uh, we, will, we, will do, uh, we will do everything we can to, uh, to, defend, to defend the euro. Uh, the second uh, reason is that the euro has delivered solid benefits to its citizens uh, over the past few years in terms of low inflation, price transparency, and elimination on tra of transaction costs and exchange rate uncertainty. Leaving the euro for a country will be uh, uh, a huge cost uh, and uh, deliver very uncertain benefits. Uh, euro is emerging from this crisis, I think. Not only emerging, but it's emerging stronger. In May 2010, the EU, uh, the EU area countries and the IMF jointly agreed to make available 110 billion euros in financing to Greece over the next three years. In December 2010, the European Council approved an 85 billion euros financial assistance package to Ireland. The European Council also agreed on the establishment of a permanent crisis management mechanism in this matter, um, this uh, European stability mechanism, which will, able, uh, which will be able to mobilize over 500 billion euros uh, to assist any member state of the Eurozone. It is, in, in other words, the, the so-called, uh, it is compared to the Article 5 of, of NATO translated into the Eurozone. And finally, last March, we have adopted the Euro Pact, uh, which aims at fostering economic growth and jobs. To sum up this point, I would say that uh, there are regular comments here and there and doubts uh, regarding the existence of the Euro. Is the euro going to disappear? 
Actually, the value of the euro, as you have noted, over the past uh, uh, few few months has been, uh, you know, quite quite strong. It's, it's it's kind of strange to have a strong currency and say at the same time that it's supposed to disappear. The reality is that Europe is putting its house together in order, uh, reducing public deficits, preparing the future by investing in research, development. We make a lot of efforts in, uh, in uh, investing in uh, strategic industries like uh, biotechnologies, nanotechnologies, uh, aerospace, renewable energy. And progress in economic governance has been made uh, and also coordination of economic policies. My second point is that the Euro, the, I'm sorry, the European Union is gradually emerging as a, a major global player in the international scene, politically, and contributes to make our world less uncertain and safer. First of all, the EU has a number of uh, external policies in trade, development aid, uh, Vicky just mentioned a few figures, and in foreign affairs. Um, we have adopted a security strategy, guidelines and strategies in various domains, uh, human rights, terrorism, uh, policy towards our neighbors, especially the Mediterranean, non-proliferation, etc. The euro exports stability, not only economically, but also politically. I would like to remind you, for instance, that we used a very uh, efficient soft power uh, in the Ukrainian crisis in 2005 and 2006, uh, and also during the war between uh, Russia and Georgia, not in the United States, Georgia in Europe, uh, in 2008. Uh, this soft power has been very, very efficient because it has uh, avoided major, major conflicts. Um, by its enlargement, uh, as I said earlier, it has increased stability in Europe and, uh, and contributed in a concrete manner to make this, this space, European space, safer. Uh, I would also say that the external action, the political external action of the European Union has been announced uh, even more uh, with the Lisbon Treaty. As you know, the Lisbon Treaty uh, institute, uh, a few, I mean, make a, a certain number of reforms regarding foreign affairs and security policy. Uh, for instance, there is the EU High Representative for Security and Foreign uh, Affairs, which is, who is both uh, the President of the uh, Foreign Affairs Council of Ministers and the Vice President of the Commission. So the external policy of the European Union is becoming more and more consistent because she, uh, Lady Ashton, uh, coordinates the various European tools uh, in these domains. So a better consistency of Euro EU foreign policy is guaranteed. Uh, to, date, to date, we have conducted, and I have a map here, which is interested at, at your disposal, 24 European military and civilian missions since 2003, all over the world, in Africa, in the Middle East, in Asia, and of course in Europe. Uh, for instance, there is a, uh, an operation that is conducted uh, offshore of uh, Somalia, uh, uh, which is called Atalanta, not Atlanta, but Atalanta, uh, since uh, 2008, to fight against uh, pi maritime piracy of the shore of Somalia. We conduct that uh, actually together also with, with, uh, with NATO. Uh, there are a few um, uh, military uh, operations in, uh, in, in Africa that we have conducted, uh, also civilian uh, uh, operation supporting uh, the state of law and uh, justice systems in, in uh, underdeveloped countries. Uh, and these, all these operations really contribute uh, a lot to the stability of these countries and to uh, the peacekeeping uh, in, in, uh, in, in these countries. Um, I would say that uh, uh, this is not uh, in competition with NATO. Uh, uh, actually, there are so many crises in the world right now that uh, you know we can use other other uh, bodies and other tools than, than NATO. And uh, m many operations that we are conducted are conducted with the help and resources of NATO, or as I said, in some in uh, offshore of Somalia, uh, together on the sides of NATO. Um, the efficiency of this action is also due to the possibility that the European Union has, maybe better than NATO, 
uh, to combine the civilian and the military tools in this operation, um, and also to intervene on every single step uh, of the crisis management, that is on prevention, um, soft diplomacy, reaction, peacekeeping, reconstruction, and development. My final point is that uh, in order to overcome all the difficulties that we encounter uh, of the world of today, this uncertain world, um, and also the regional crisis, we need not less but more international cooperation. And in that regard, uh, the partnership between the United States and Europe, uh, which is already very strong, is really necessary and essential. Um, Europe, the US and the EU uh, also, uh, today faces common challenges, uh, and we have the same interests. It is true internally. What strikes me is that uh, when I read the headlines of newspapers every day in Europe and, and, and in the States, it's almost the same. Uh, you're talking about economic difficulties, unemployment, public deficits, the debt, immigration, uh, the difficulties we have to deal with uh, Mus our Muslim population internally and with the Muslim world externally. Uh, we, in the global world, face uh, common political challenges, uh, terrorism, nuclear proliferation, um, uh, peace process in, uh, uh, between, in the Middle East between Israel and the Palestinians. We also share the same economic challenges, the recession, the difficulties and the, the uh, difficulties and, and, and slowness of the, of the economic recovery uh, from the recession of 2008. Uh, because of the same kind of industrial uh, uh, process that we uh, have experienced, uh, we uh, also face the same basic uh, urban development problems, uh, environment, environmental issues, uh, and, and so forth. And last but not e least, uh, the world is totally changing, uh, with new powers appear, uh, appearing on the international scene, and who need to be included in the uh, international decision-making process. I speak, of, of course, about, about China, about India, Brazil, South Africa, and so forth. Today, the, the partnership between the EU and the US is already very strong. I have to highlight, and uh, as a French representative, I think it's, it's important, the, the strong uh, military alliance that uh, today NATO is. Um, uh, uh, the last NATO summit in November adopted a, a new strategic concept, uh, which contributes to renovate the alliance and to adapt it to uh, new threats and to the new world. Um, uh, France is very active in that, uh, in that direction. In Afghanistan, uh, NATO is, uh, is, is the, main, uh, the main force. We fight side by side to the, uh, uh, against the Taliban. There are about 80,000 military soldiers on the ground in Afghanistan and 30,000 uh, European. It seems unbalanced, but uh, if you take into consideration that uh, the, the European Union is simultaneously engaged in more than 20 military and civilian operations around the world, I think it's, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty good. Um, Lutz talked about Libya. I would say that uh, NATO is very efficient today on, in Libya. Uh, uh, the European Union had some disagreements on, on Libya, but we, we don't stop there. We go ahead. Uh, I think that uh, the European states which uh, intervene in Libya uh, in the forefront, uh, uh, are still very active there, and uh, I would say that uh, we're getting more and more efficient uh, to, uh, to get to, uh, to our goal. And, and also the European Union is preparing uh, and is at the disposal of the United Nations to assist, uh, to, to, to set up a military operation to protect any humanitarian assistance, especially to Misrata. Um, we have um, uh, underlined previously, I will not come back to it, the the stronger economic link between the, the US and, uh, and Europe, especially uh, uh, trade. You had two billion in mind. I think I had three billion of the figure. The, the amount of exchange between the Europe and, uh, European Union and the US trade and investment is about three billion uh, euros a day. Uh, that, that is a lot. Actually, the two economies represent 54% 50 of, the, of the world GDP. Uh, and so we are really major partners economically. 
also facing uh, global challenges such as non-proliferation, terrorism, the cooperation is, is very strong. Um, uh, following the, the, the elimination of, uh, of uh, Osama bin Laden, which was, I think, a strategic victory against terrorism, uh, the, the excellent cooperation between uh, European countries and Europe and the United States will continue. I will, I will s stop stop here, not, not to be too long, but I will probably come back on each of these issues uh, later on. Thank you. Thank you, Pascal. You've covered a lot of ground there. Um, so I think I'll keep us moving along and introduce now um, Annabel Malins, the uh, Consul General for the U United Kingdom. Thank you. Thanks very much, Vicky. And um, good morning to all of you. Uh, thank you very much for being here. I think one of the things that I've noticed since my arrival in the Southeast that the EU really doesn't get a lot of press. It's clearly not a very sexy subject, and I, I really congratulate you on taking an interest to find out more about the EU this morning. And thank you very much to Vicky and the EU CE for organizing today. I thought I'd um, talk a little bit um, and focus specifically on, on the external affairs of, um, of the European Union and particularly our relationship with the US and, and some of the current events that we've been seeing in the Middle East and North Africa. Um, some of you may know that the, the UK has a coalition government since um, just a year ago. Uh, I think it's just coming up to its birthday, actually. And um, it has um, been a coalition between our Conservative Party and uh, um, a Liberal Democrat Party. And, and they've had to you know, forge their thinking on um, their position in the European Union. And, have come out very strongly um, to ensure that we are um, an active and an activist member of the European Union. Um, the European Union is absolutely central to our national interests, um, and that uh, is, we set out some overriding goals for the nature of our engagement, which is all around ensuring that all of the nations of Europe um, are equipped to face the challenges of the 21st century and um, simply put you know those challenges are around global competitiveness around global warming and also um, global poverty and those are three um, overarching areas of concern a lot of focus at the moment on on trade um, on developing the single market and also on economic growth and for us, um, the top priority, I think pretty much as it is here in the United States, is on economic growth. And we're working with EU partners to equip the EU to compete globally in the 21st century. And that means keeping people employed and creating new jobs. And of course, trade and developing trade links is a very crucial part of that. Another crucial part of it is helping Europe to transition to a low carbon economy with low carbon energy and transport infrastructure and of course low carbon trade and the vision for Europe is that it is, uh, will be a, a, a leader, a global leader in the low carbon economy and I, I know I, I share that mission with all my colleagues here on the stage, um, all our economies are very much facing in the same direction and I'm delighted that there's an event um, later today which will tell us a little bit more about how that's being implemented. Well, some of you may know that um, the European Union um, now has a representative for foreign affairs and security policy and um, that representative um, who has a role broadly equivalent to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton's, it happens to be British, it's um, Baroness Catherine Ashton. Now, her agenda um, as EU representative is not the UK's agenda, it's the European Union's agenda in its external relations. But I thought perhaps that would give me a reason to focus a little bit on, on um, our external relations. And of course, the starting point of that is the EU-US partnership. It's very long-standing, and for those of you um, who are probably much more knowledge about history than I am, um, you'll know that um, all of the, um, the nations represented on the panel this morning have long-standing histories with the United States in their own right. Um, my country um, first had representation here back in the 1780s 
Um, and I, I don't think I'm competing with my colleagues. I suspect uh, they also have very long histories um, with this part of the country too. Um, but the European Union, um, as, an, as an identifiable um, institution and body, also has a long-standing relationship with the United States. And I believe it, the very first representation of the European Union was in Washington, D.C. The Transatlantic Economic Partnership is a, a very key driver of the global economy. And you've already heard some comments about that. It's characterized as being the, the largest, most integrated, and most enduring relationship in the world. You've already heard that um, the EU and U.S economies combined are more than 50% of the global economy, and yet um, our regions combined uh, only account for about 12% of the global population. We also, between us, you know, the trade between um, our two major economic blocks are something like 40% of world trade. So if we're talking about um, economic um, recovery and we're interested in how much trade contributes to that, of course, you know, trade between the EU and the US is very significant indeed. Um, importantly, in terms of global poverty, which is a huge um, source of instability and uncertainty in the world, um, we are also together very significant. We contribute um, collectively 80% of official development assistance. 50% comes, or a little bit more than 50% comes from the EU, and uh, around 25% comes from, from the US. So that's a very important contribution that we're making to helping to address that source of instability. And of course, the reason why we can do that so successfully is because we, held, um, you know, we have deeply held values um, which are shared between us, and they're at the very core of our relationship. We're all um, committed to the rule of law, to democracy, um, to human rights, alleviating poverty and free and fair market economies. So we're very natural partners when it comes to addressing the global challenges. There are four major goals of the EU-US relationship. Um, one of those is promoting uh, peace and stability and uh, democracy and development worldwide. Another element is in responding to global challenges, um, with terrorism being an example of that. Um, the third one is in expansion of world trade and close economic relations. And the fourth is building transatlantic bridges. And um, a lot of us here uh, are very much involved in those transatlantic bridges, whether they're characterized by exchanges on energy environment, um, on counterterrorism, on um, on crisis management, on research and development, on education, all of those areas are encompassed in the types of bridges that we have um, built between our two regions. The EU is the world's largest um, economic body. Um, it account accounts for 20% of global trade. And uh, I um, often tell people that um, the UK is responsible for uh, around about a million um, jobs in the United States. Um, but actually, the EU collectively is responsible indirectly or, or, or directly for something like seven um, or eight million United States jobs. So we're very important um, investors in each other's countries. And of course, the EU benefits um, very considerably from US investment. Almost half of US international investment is actually in the European Union. And we're both each other's top trading partners, both in go um, goods and in services. But to, uh, turning uh, now a little bit more to um, you know, what's going on in the world today, um, and particularly um, the really, the, uh, I guess the eruption of democracy in the Middle East and North Africa that we've seen um, probably the most important development in the early 21st century, uh, that what we're watching now in the Middle East and North Africa and I know that um, our uh, Foreign Minister, William Hague, thinks that what we're seeing is potentially greater um, than either um, the 9-11 or uh, the global financial crisis in 2008 in terms of its consequences for, uh, for global development. 
the death of, of bin Laden has clearly been a devastating blow, um, but it's not been a terminal blow for Al-Qaeda. And we will all need to continue the fight against terrorism. But in the long run, it's the people of the Muslim world which will be the ones to inflict the greatest defeat of Al-Qaeda. And that's why what's happening in the Middle East and North Africa today is so important to us. I think um, the real true expression of the Muslim world is, is not what happened on 9-11. It's what was seen in Tahrir Square in earlier this year, in 2011. And we take from that so three main lessons um, on what we call the Arabs from the Arab Spring. And I think they're very um, informative in terms of the type of role that the EU plays in future challenges. The Arab Spring will sweep more widely. Um, it, it's demanding um, demands for open government and greater political participation is something which um, you know, cannot be put back in the box. Governments that set their face against reform, like Libya and as we're starting to see in Syria, are doomed to failure. And I, I think um, one can see that in the response that you've seen from the European Union and from our international partners. Um, but it's, the signals are there for, um, for other governments that try to resist this type of reform. And the political changes in the Middle East and North Africa reveal a really immense economic task. Those individuals that are laying their lives on the line for liberty are also seeking economic um, freedom. They want to fully participate in the global economy. And those, peop those individuals' expectations need to be met. Otherwise, we risk um, the region um, falling back either into authoritarian regimes or into conflict and increased instability. So we're at a very significant moment in terms of the advancement um, of global development. So um, the engagement that's taking place now in that region is hugely significant. And the European role um, is, is particularly so. We need to be forming um, you know, a transformation of the relationship with the Middle East and North Africa, which takes into account the struggles that are going on. And it's certainly in Europe's interest to use um, the EU weight in the world to advance our common goals and values um, and to support the change that's taking place. At the end of the, the Cold War, um, it was the EU that offered a hand of friendship to the new democracies of Central and Eastern Europe um, after the fall of communism. And uh, many of those countries have now uh, very successful partners with us in the European Union. And I think now what we're seeing is something very similar to um, the fall of communism that we're seeing now being mirrored um, to the South. And what's happening there is as closely tied to European security and prosperity. And I think we can, we can really look forward to seeing the EU's economic magnetism um, to, as, as part of um, a whole international collective um, strategy to encourage and support real political and economic reform um, in that region which will contribute very meaningfully to uh, wider stability for the world in general. So I'd like to reiterate um, in closing some of the comments that you've heard from my colleagues about the EU's role, um, not um, certainly um, in some cases in terms of our military um, power, but also um, as our soft power through um, economic instruments and um, the EU as a political force for good in dealing with the uncertainties in the 21st century. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Annabelle. And again, we'll just uh, keep moving so that we have a little bit of time for Q&A with the audience. So next, I would like to introduce Mr. Benoit Standard, Consul General of Belgium. Good morning. 
As a general rule, I feel European. Today, I feel especially European because of the air conditioning. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to Georgia Tech. I'll, I'll, I'll be very short because there are a lot of ground which has, which has been covered by my excellent colleagues, so I, I, I will not repeat, and I, I would prefer to devote as, many, as much time as we can to questions and answers. I, I'll make a quick few points on the um, political front and on the economical front. On the political front, uh, it has sometimes been argued, rightly or wrongly, that there is a uh, so-called democra democratic gap or democratic deficit in Europe between the leaders and, and the population. As, as an assessment of uh, our presidency, uh, my good colleague John uh, told you that we held the presidency just previous to the, to the Hungarians, we have reached a certain amount of results which I would like to share with you. And one of these results is that from now on in the European Union, um, we have what we called the European Citizens Initiative. Uh, it has not been used as yet, but the instrument at least exists. And this means that subject to the collection of about one million signatures, the citizens of Europe can have a say in the legislative procedure. I think this is a very important point which will help to bridge the so-called um, democratic uh, deficit. Second point, um, we all know the, this famous phrase of uh, Mr. Kissinger who said, uh, whom have I to call if I want to call somebody in Europe? And again, uh, I think the question is still there, but there has been tremendous um, um, uh, amount of, um, uh, of progress being done in the direction of creating for Europe more stability in its um, expression, more visibility, and more unicity. And we have, uh, we know now that uh, with Lady Ashton, we have a person who is in charge of the external affairs. We have also, and that has been uh, reached very recently, uh, the uh, president, the permanent president of the um, European Council, who happens to be a Belgian, Mr. Van Rompuy, has a voice in the General Assembly of the UN. So next to the, I believe, 192 nations, you have one seat, one voice, which is expressed in the name of the entire European Union. And I think this is very important. Finally, um, and also politically, uh, there was this saying that the United States are from Mars and that Europe is from Venus. Uh, <laughs> I myself prefer Venus to Mars, but um, I, we, we have to, to realize that there has been recently a very important shift from Venus to Mars on the part of Europe. I think it has been said, uh, I want to stress it once again, what's happening in Libya and what might happen, uh, happen in, in Syria and other countries uh, is very important and we have not been caught, caught unawares, we are there and we do our job. On the economical level, uh, our, our, our final, I think our ideal in, in Europe is to, to create uh, free trade uh, agreements. And again, I, I want to just highlight one very good example of that, uh, which has uh, been concluded under the, the Belgian presidency that is last year, that is the free trade agreement between Europe and South Korea. Now, this is very significant. This, this means that as far as economic ties are concerned, South Korea enjoys exactly the same right as the 27 members. Not politically, of course, but economically, it is very significant. And we, the European Union, we would like to see 
such trade agreements signed with other region or other countries and I think uh, there is a uh, good hope that in the in the in the very um, uh, coming future we will sign such a free trade agreement with um, Malaysia finally um, we, we have uh, expressed the importance of the transatlantic trade. Uh, let, me, let me give you one, one more uh, term of comparison. Uh, Belgium is a tiny country. We have, uh, well, in, in terms of size and size of population, we have exactly the same population as Georgia. We have 10 million inhabitants just as you, as you have. I want you to pause and reflect on one fact. The investment, the US, the American investment in Belgium is more important than the US investment in China and India combined. I repeat, because you do not believe me, <laughs> there is more investment from US in Belgium than in China and India combined. And again, in the other direction, we as a tiny country, the size of Georgia, we rank number 20 as far as Belgian investments in the US are concerned. I think this gives an idea. Uh, I read, uh, this was last week, an interview by your excellent ambassador, Mr. Howard Goodman, uh, ambassador of the United States in, in, in Belgium. And he said that the um, relationship between the US and, and Belgium in particular are good, but that they could be far, far better. And, and here again, I would like to take up this, this challenge and, 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 and see with you how you and us can do uh, what we can to get the relationship between Europe and the United States far, far better. I think it can be done, and I'm very full of hope that that can be done. Um, trio, Hungary. In Europe, Europe, the, the, the 27, uh, you can consider them as a mature market, very rich people, but also an aging population. But what is the interest of Europe for the United States and other investors? Well, at our borders, we have a huge reservoir of growth. And that starts in, within the, 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 the 27 of uh, comprising the, the, the European Union. The, the most growth you experience right now at the moment within the euro would be in Poland, Romania, the Baltic states, and then just next to it, you have Ukraine and Turkey, which are significant um, players in the world of today. And so I invite you to consider uh, Europe as a destination of not only investment, but also of interest. Uh, the summer is there. Please come and visit us and take advantage of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Benoit. Next, I'm pleased to introduce to you the newest member of the European Consular Corps, uh, Mr. Paul Gleeson, uh, the Consul General for Ireland. Thank you, Vicky, and it's great to be here. This is our first Europe Day, all right, in Atlanta. Uh, and congrats to you, Vicky and Ansley, and everyone here with the European Centre for the wonderful job that you guys do. Um, it's our first here because last year the Irish government decided that uh, they wanted to open their... Uh, first consulate ever in the American South, and our first one anywhere in the US since 1933. It took us 75 years to make up our minds, but we, <laughs> we got here eventually and uh, just set up in the last few months. And one of the reasons it's been very easy to set up is that we've got such wonderful EU colleagues here in Atlanta who've been a great source of advice ever since we arrived. Pascal gave me the first early good bit of advice to buy a GPS, which is the most important <laughs> thing you can do in Atlanta. And everything then from where to uh, drink good German and Belgian beers to where you can watch Ireland beat England in the rugby um, <laughs> uh, great sources of advice all the way along the line and I've joked before that no one has been uh, happier to see us or more welcoming than our Greek colleague here as well because 
finally someone else can take some of the economic heat for a while <laughs> and some of those tough questions. So Vasilius has given us a particularly warm welcome since we arrived as well. Um, Ireland's relations with the European Union uh, have been superb ever since we joined. We joined on the same day as uh, Great Britain and Denmark back in 1973. And the EU has been a source of remarkable support um, and, and advice and good help to Ireland. Uh, going back those, what are they now, 38 years. Um, it's been a remarkable source of support for agriculture in Ireland, for education in Ireland, uh, for our infrastructural development in Ireland. But also, not many people know as well, for the peace process in Ireland and in Northern Ireland. And the EU gave huge amounts of uh, support through the peace and interreg programmes for uh, cross-border and cross-community peaceful initiatives that don't hardly get any publicity, hardly got any publicity um, around the world. But it was that kind of quiet, intensive and, and strong financial support that the EU gave which helped to make relations between the communities in Ireland so much more improved to the extent that we now have a very successful peace process and very stable political system as well. But of course, we've had more recent difficulties, and Ireland in particular has had very severe economic difficulties. We had a property market which fell off a cliff, um, and as a result, a regular property boom and bust, plain vanilla, uncomplicated, but that was what we had. Um, and that left us, obviously, with banks in severe need of recapitalization and with a fiscal deficit that needed to be reduced as well. And in the context of that, we've got um, great support again from the European Union stepping up to the mark. We've got um, a loan, albeit at a, at a pretty significant interest rate, but we've got a loan from the European Union and from our international partners to help uh, Ireland recover uh, from that deficit and to help us recapitalize our, ba our banks as well. And obviously, at the moment, we're, we're, we're the whole Eurozone is dealing with um, those problems and the problems that are inherent, perhaps, in dealing with a monetary union that doesn't have full political union, and how we try and overcome those difficulties. It is a unique experiment. The whole European Union, uh, designed to help Europe and the world recover from two world wars centered in Europe, and it's been a remarkable success in that sense. But it, it is operating almost in a world without precedence for what we're trying to do. And the Eurozone is one of those very good examples. And uh, it, it has resulted in, in very significant challenges, and we're facing into very significant challenges now. But given what Europe has overcome uh, over recent decades, and uh, the energy, as Pascal described, that has put in to uh, resolving these difficulties, there's every reason to be optimistic. And in Ireland, we, we, we've, we've got good reason to be optimistic now. We've seen a strong recovery in our exports. We've seen, we will see growth return to the economy this year. Um, and we will continue, I think, to be ranked as one of the 10 best places in the world to do business. So I think we've every reason to be optimistic, both in an Irish and in a European sense. But I think also Europe has been unfortunate to have these Eurozone difficulties come right now when we've just come through a period of trying to um, improve the European institutions over so many years, with Maastricht, with Amsterdam, with Nice, which took two referenda in Ireland to get through, with the Constitutional Treaty, with Lisbon, which also took two referenda in Ireland to get through. We've come through a long period of, of what our critics call navel-gazing, but what we would defend as very important reforms to allow us to operate as a European Union of 27 or 28 member states. We've come to a long period of that, and then I think just as we were ready to take the success story to the world, um, we've been hit by a financial tsunami, which has forced us maybe to be introspective again in terms of the European Union and, and, and making sure our own um, internal house is in order. But I think we are trying to deal with that as aggressively as possible. It's just been perhaps unfortunate that just as we came through Lisbon and were able to get Lisbon implemented, that now we have uh, these strong difficulties to deal with in terms of the Eurozone. But I think, as my colleagues have illustrated, in certain areas, particularly in the soft power areas, we've been very strong in terms of what we've been able to export, whether that's in terms of climate change, human rights, development assistance, we've been very strong. But there are other areas in which perhaps we need to up our game, and I think we recognize we need to up our game. Innovation is one. We're all trying to build smart economies that can compete in the global economy of the 21st century. And I think in our investment in innovation, um, we need to prioritize that and keep that very strong. Certainly, if you look like 
countries like South Korea and Japan, the money they're putting into innovation, it's incumbent uh, on Europe to do likewise. And that's why it's a good thing that we've got programs like the Seven Framework Program in Europe, which is devoting 51 billion euro towards cross-border research and development, which can help keep Europe strong in these most important of areas. But I also think in terms of the European social model as well. You hear a lot of knocking about government involvement in society as well in this part of the world. But I think if you look at the European social model, if you take a health system like Germany, which invests less per capita than the US in its health care, and has better health outcomes across every single measure, I think there's a lot to be said for the European social system the Euro a, a, an advocacy of that as well, that occasionally government can do things right. It's not just in defence and security, but government can play a very important role, as I think a number of the European economies illustrate very well. I think there's an important advocacy role there as well. So that's all I have to say, but again, thank you for being here. It's a great to spend our first Europe Day here in Georgia Tech, which is also a great partner of Ireland as well. Thanks, Vicky. Thank you very much, Paul. The best way to approach a topic like the one we have here as EU leadership in an uncertain world is to start defining the terms that you have. You have EU, you have leadership, and you have an uncertain world. I think the most controversial one is leadership. And that is because uh, the conventional wisdom um, wants leadership to actually require a leader, one leader, and um, the same conventional wis wisdom wants leadership to mean to take swift action. In the European Union, we have neither. We don't have one leader, and we don't have swift action. And that's, for the outsiders, the problem of the European Union. What you have to keep in mind, and I think it has been highlighted by my colleagues uh, who spoke earlier, is that the European Union is nothing like the things that we've known. It's a unique thing, it's a unique project, and it's a project in the making. And what my colleagues have highlighted, if I may summarize what has been said, is that the European Union still keeps on leading, showing the way in its own way, just because it's unique. That's about it. I think um, I can now rest and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> try to warm our hands, we have frostbite, as I'm sure many of you do. Um, thank you very much for this extraordinary set of comments and reflections. I'm going to now open the floor up for a, about 10 or 15 minutes of uh, Q&A. So who wants to go first? Augustine? Well, I think that uh, there is a long tradition of relation uh, between France and Africa, which is, of course, a matter of controversy, but uh, we have a, a long tradition of relation. And uh, uh, we have uh, uh, led the European Union of, over the past uh, 20 years to get interested in Africa and the destiny of Africa, which we are very optimistic for. We believe that Africa uh, will, uh, will uh, be uh, Mo much more developed in, in, the, in, uh, in the 21st century and, and will count more on the international arena. We concentrated um, the European action uh, in a few countries like Congo uh, uh, and, uh, and other, other African countries uh, on a peacekeeping mission and peace, uh, uh, peacemaking mission sometimes. Um, uh, also consolidating democracy, human rights, and uh, law, uh, state of law in, in, in such country. And as, as, you, um, uh, as you know, the, the, the latest uh, uh, French contribution to this, uh, uh, to this particular um, uh, democratization process uh, was in Ivory Coast, where we supported uh, the United Nations forces. Uh, and try to uh, to, in, to to solve the political um, uh, the political confusion that uh, uh, followed the, the last presidential election, and so the um, uh, putting a house together in Europe, as you said, it, it's quite different. But 
but uh, we have tried to um, uh, lead European Union to really have a consistent uh, action of cooperation, of course, economic aid, but also uh, democratiz democratization aid uh, by uh, uh, interesting the European Union in uh, civilian uh, security and defense uh, uh, operation, as well as military operations. Thank you. <clears throat> Next question. Um, I'm sorry, I was just being instructed to repeat the question so it's sure to be recorded. Um, but I'm going to have to ask you to repeat the question because I didn't hear it as I was um, listening to that. I think you asked about uh, other forms of cooperation among EU member states, particularly in technical fields. And also uh, women leaders. Is there a particular person you would like to address your question to? Perhaps the only woman among the European <laughs> Consular Corps. <laughs> no. Well, we do have some excellent ro role models across Europe um, in um, high responsibilities um, in politics, in business, and um, in all parts of civil society. Um, but I, I think actually that it continu continues to be an area of challenge. Um, somewhat similar to um, within the United States. And there are various um, um, programs to try and promote women's positions um, as, as they play such an important role in improving the quality of decision making um, across all areas of society. Uh, but it would be great to, to think that we are leaders in that area. I'm, I'm afraid that I'm not sure that the, the facts would, um, would back us up on that claim. Um, but with regards to your question about innovation, um, I can link that also to women leaders. We do have some fa fabulous women scientists um, working across um, the European <laughs> Union. Um, it's an area where uh, we do have um, governments in, within the European Union that have made very significant um, expansions of their science budgets to underpin um, research and innovation. Um, the UK is one of those, and um, we work very closely with European partners um, on collaboration in research, just as we do here in the United States, because we see that as being such a fundamental component of um, delivering future economic benefits. It's not just a, a question of um, developing um, you know, new technologies for business opportunity. It's also um, technologies which can help address some of the political and um, uh, and social challenges which we face, whether it's in terms of um, global health or to do with the low carbon um, needs of our future economy. So uh, it, that's a very important part of, of the, you know, tr the driving thinking on innovation. Thanks. Yes. yes. Thank you. Um, I believe you wanted to offer a comment as well. Just to, to add to it, Annabelle has answered the question in a very structural way, with, which I think is an advantage of, of uh, uh, female thinking. Often I find that uh, women leadership provides much more structural solutions. And if I may add, uh, add a m more person-based element to it, I believe that uh, in Europe there are more queens than kings. And uh, also, I only name two excellent European leaders, uh, Christine Lagarde, who was here in, in Atlanta a few years ago and gave a wonderful presentation, and who is now the, pro the, the, the uh, finance minister of France, and Angela Merkel, who, uh, by the way, a scientist from East Germany, uh, who is the chancellor of Germany. Thank you. John, please. I wanted to, to just add one, one brief note as a follow-up that doesn't focus specifically on women, but the, I think it's related somehow, is that the first priority of the, the current Hungarian presidency, as, and this comes from the trio approach as well, uh, Belgium and, and Spain, and I'm sure that uh, Poland, which follows, will, will, will continue to 
follow this priority is growth, jobs, and social inclusion. And I think about growth and jobs as maybe being on one side of the equation and social inclusion, including women, on the other side, but they're, but they're not. They're, they're inextricably related, interrelated. Um, where the focus is, though, on social inclusion is not so much on, on the role of women, but it's, uh, at least in the, internally in Europe, it focuses on, on the need to um, continue to fight poverty, which is directly related to, to economic growth and jobs. And, and there, the, the focus uh, currently in the European Union is to ensure that um, um, minority populations within Europe, which seem to be um, the, uh, the source of much of the, the poverty that exists there, uh, need to be, needs to be addressed. And uh, more specifically, uh, at least, uh, the role of the, the Roma or the gypsy population in, in Europe and, and further integration into, into Europe as Europeans so that this promotes um, jobs and growth. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, next question. I'd be curious to know if there's a delicate census among our distinguished panelists here um, as to whether there can be 50 years from now, uh, individual nations in Europe will have to have considerably less of a, of a voice upon foreign affairs, individual voice, and a much stronger European voice upon foreign affairs. Okay, I'll try to repeat the question uh, posed by uh, Vice Provost and Professor Yves Berthelot of Georgia Tech, um, who's curious to know uh, your opinion over the next 50 years, whether or not we will see um, greater co coherence and, and unity uh, among European Union member states. Is that a fair? And, and, and giving up some of your own uh, individual nations, uh, nation state sovereignty in formulating a, a common position. So I see the French Consul General has positioned the microphone to be the first out of the bat to answer this question. Pascal. Yes, I will argue that um, actually this is, a, uh, I think, um, a strong will from, from France. It's uh, uh, also consistent with, uh, we think, that is the evolution of the world, where we'll see, we are seeing uh, emergence of uh, Multilateral, uh, multilaterality, poles, regional poles that uh, uh, are const constitute themselves as uh, as, as symbols and as um, uh, as voices in the world. Uh, in Asia, it would be China and and, and and maybe India. In South uh, in South America, you can also see uh, symbols uh, in in Africa, definitely. And um, I, I think uh, uh, Europe will. Uh, d its destiny is to have to speak one voice, uh, but it will be a long process. I I think that uh, there are uh, individual countries, and definitely my country is one of them, uh, who, who want, wants to have a, a strong voice uh, today on the international arena uh, because of different uh, uh, interests that we have uh, uh, in the world. Uh, but once again, the, our political project in the long term, I would say, is to have a, a strong European voice uh, in the world. Uh, we believe it's in its interest, and it's, we believe also it's in the interest of the world because of the values that we defend, uh, democracy, human rights, state of law. Yes, Benoit and Annabelle afterwards. I, I would like, thank you, Pascal. Uh, uh, I would like to, to add one little comment on this uh, to put things in perspective uh, and I'm talking in the name of Belgium which is a small nation and I think it's important to understand the perspective of things from the point of view of small nations and I believe that's particularly difficult for you Americans because you're not a small nation. Um, we, uh, Belgium, uh, as a small nation have been the first one to understand the need to unite. Uh, previous to the construction of the European Union, we built a union of three small nations, the neighboring nations of the Netherlands, 
the Great Duchy of Luxembourg and, and Belgium. And we, we understand that we are better united as small nations than divided. Uh, on the same terms, we are probably, and certainly I will say, uh, more prepared to give up uh, our sovereignty to a bigger um, uh, un uh, to a bigger ensemble like the European Union than our bigger nations like the UK, Germany, and France. But I'm glad to hear that France uh, is prepared in the long run to uh, have a Europe speaking with one voice. Um, for the ones who um, spend time reading, I would specially recommend um, a recent book by Milan Kundera, who is a splendid Czech writer, is in his latest um, collection of essays called The Curtain, there is a very, very good description of what it means to be a small nation within Europe. I recommend this reading. Thank you. If I may, uh, just to add to that, um, it's not size that's um, a factor in uh, what's going to happen in the future. Um, you have to take into account other things, um, like geography, for instance. Yeah. Being a small nation is um, certainly a drawback in that sense, but um, where you're positioned is, um, is very important as well. I mean, it's not the same thing facing the Eastern Mediterranean um, and the same thing facing the Atlantic. So I think in order to take this further and actually build upon what we have in order to reach the goal, which is a common foreign policy, we should take into account different interests from different nations um, across the spectrum. Mm -hmm. That is, um, nations that are in the, in the South, nations that are in the North, and so on and so forth. So I would like to emphasize this. Uh, geography plays a, a significant role in uh, how you, um, the EU foreign policy is going to be formulated in the near future. Thank you. Thank you. And in my prerogative as moderator, Annabelle, I'm going to give you the last word of our Thanks. program this morning. Thank you very much. I shall be very brief. Um, the, the UK is also very um, fixed on, um, on the EU uh, developing a strong voice on um, external affairs. Um, it's definitely an ambition um, for my country. Um, I'm not sure that it necessarily means that um, that has to be accompanied by, um, by giving up of, of sovereignty on such issues. And um, it's quite possible, I think, that the, the EU could have a stronger voice now um, under you know, the current um, institutional arrangements. And I think in order to um, you know, sort of develop further in that direction, um, one of the aspects which um, is debated in the UK among our population is the degree of um, representation of um, citizens um, within European decision making. And as you know, there is a European Parliament uh, which is um, um, gaining sort of further strength and influence. And I think as confidence in that decision making process um, builds, there may be opportunities um, for, for confidence um, to move along in that direction. In, in the UK, we currently have before our parliament um, an EU bill, and that actually commits the government to um, put to um, a referendum any um, change which is being introduced in Europe which could um, move, shift um, power to um, European bodies uh, away from our national government. Um, so I just wanted to mention that because it, it is a very much a current debate um, within the UK. Thanks. Thank you very much. If I may ask one thing, Vicky, just very small. Yes. What's going to help us in the future is this new diplomatic service because it's going to be a mixture of uh, um, f uh, national diplomats, uh, uh, diplomats from the European Commission, and also from the European Council. So this uh, mixture will probably enhance the European culture of diplomacy and, and external action and uh, help us in that direction. Thank you. I'm sorry to have to bring this to an abrupt uh, closure, but our next um, 
uh, program takes place downtown. We have uh, hosted by the World Affairs Council at the Commerce Club, the Secretary General of NATO. I know many of you will be attending that luncheon and we had intended to wrap up our morning program by 1115. Um, let me just remind you that we will resume the program this afternoon promptly at 2 p.m. Uh, so we have a symposium from 2 to 5 p.m. followed by a reception. So I hope you will all return and be with us for the afternoon program. Um, I'd like to say a special word of thanks to Ansley Hines, who's not in the room now. Um, but she's been extraordinary in coordinating this event and bringing everyone together, and I want to thank her with every opportunity I have, so you'll hear it again this afternoon. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, it's, a, it's a busy time of the year, um, and we appreciate the fact that you came out, and we hope to see you again this afternoon. Um, please join me in thanking our extraordinary panelists, um, the Atlanta's European Consular Corps. Thank you very much. <laughs>